Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a great, it's a great pleasure to be here and an honour to uh, to start the proceedings. Um, thanks to all for being here. Uh, thank you, Ozan, for your uh, kind invitation and your kind words. And I'm I'm really looking forward to the uh, presentations uh, today and tomorrow. And um, this building of relationships, which I think is uh, is the purpose of this of this event, that we start some conversations, we consolidate and build uh, towards. Um, more successful work uh, in the future. Um, <clears throat> today I want, to, I want to speak to the conference theme of uh, social movements, resistance and social change um, and taking uh, as my lead the, the problem of what is possible. I take it that um, most of us here are concerned with political agency, concerned and puzzled by the problem of political agency with the uh, formation and elaboration of political subjectivity, which, as Alain Badiou specifies, involves a problem of the principle of orientation towards a truth procedure. I'll speak then of principles of orientation today. Orientation for radical thought, radical philosophy, and for political activism. Orientation towards what? towards capital in the 21st century, which I will designate as our problem. <coughs> when I speak of capital in the 21st century, I'm referring both to um, this little book by Thomas Piketty, which goes by that title, and the book is, um, I, I guess you're probably all aware of it, and hopefully some of you have read it, it's uh, been widely discussed in the, uh, in the business uh, press and, and beyond, um, has been noticed uh, by uh, politicians around uh, the world, and uh, and hopefully will be uh, that that reason that I'm referring to the book will make sense. But the other referent of this uh, capital in the 21st uh, century uh, is to do with that object of social criticism, the object which we are, are focused on here. Um, I'm going to read. The paper is um, somewhat uh, heavy. Hopefully, we won't all fall asleep after uh, after lunch. And the only other caveat I will make is that I will not insert little quotation marks, but I'll be quoting uh, heavily as we go through from, uh, from Piketty and from others. I won't signal their quotations, but do ask me if I'm quoting or not. <clears throat> How then to read capital in the 21st century? Toward the end of the preface to the phenomenology of spirit, clearly anticipating the reception of all sizable books and not only his own, Hegel emphasises the hard work required by thinking. He presents the activity of philosophy as a strenuous exertion, one that always struggles against the cheap and easy seductions of received wisdom, also against sensualism and romanticism, and against the idea that understanding could be achieved on the basis of brute sense perception alone. He therefore writes with biting wit, and here I quote, no matter how much someone asks for the royal road to science, no more convenient and comfortable way can be suggested to him than to put his trust in healthy common sense. And then, for what else remains, to advance simply with the times and with philosophy, read reviews of philosophical works, perhaps even go so far as to read the prefaces and the first paragraphs of the works themselves. After all, the preface provides the general principles on which everything turns, and the reviews provide both the historical memoranda and the critical assessment, which, because it is a critical assessment, exists on a higher plane than what it assesses. One can, of course, traverse this ordinary path in one's dressing gown. <laughs> Consistent with Hegel's uh, constant insistence against the Greek presupposition that philosophy is a kind of work available only to those who are afforded a life of leisure, Hegel is dismissive of the shortcuts that are taken by those who imagine that philosophy might come easily. This is parody of the comfortable repose of this figure in the dressing gown, which of course appears in the first of Descartes' meditations. It's in this context that Hegel writes, true thoughts and scientific insight can only be won by the labour of the concept. This labour of the concept involves the most patient care and runs against the temptations of the day. It involves resisting rushing to judgment and leaping ahead of one's material rather than staying with what he calls the matter at hand, the thing that matters. Thus, Hegel's apparently paradoxical argument that 
The easiest thing of all is to pass judgment on what is substantial and meaningful. It is much more difficult to get a real grip on it. Here Hegel stresses the need to struggle against seeing in a book or in the work of a thinker something that is merely either true or false in its entirety. Science, for Hegel, is something very different from the inspiration which begins immediately, like a shot from a pistol, as he says, with absolute knowledge, which is already finished with all the other standpoints simply by declaring that it will take no notice of them. Hegel therefore argues in his Science of Logic in relation to the idea of what a refutation of a philosophical system would be, he says, we must get over the distorted idea that the system has to be represented as if thoroughly false, and as if the true system stood to the false as only opposed to it. By contrast, he says, effective refutation must infiltrate the opponent's stronghold and meet him on his own ground. There is no point in attacking him outside his territory and claiming jurisdiction where he is not. These demands from Hegel, this is two centuries ago, these demands have a remarkable durability, maybe in this mediated age as well of uh, online reviews and uh, blogs and Amazon analyses of books. There is also a short version of this, a, a summary version for executives, uh, kind of, uh, you can buy it on cassette tape or on, on uh, a DVD or something. Hegel's remarks have durability because of the seductions that lie in the ease of speed reading and the small victories that can be seized by focusing on particulars from an abstract outside. Against this, the effort to transcend the system from within marks some of the most productive appropriations of Hegel in radical philosophy and in radical politics through the 19th and 20th centuries and, I will argue, retain vital lessons for radical philosophy and radical politics in the 21st. For now, let it be said that the first point of orientation I'm proposing is to work with the matter at hand rather than shoot right past it. It is on such grounds, on the grounds of the thing, that possibilities can arise. The position of the lonely outside is satisfying, a satisfying delusion, but a delusion nonetheless. Of course, at some point we have to decide, but decisions should not be made in advance. As Derrida once put it, when I try to decipher a text, I do not constantly ask myself if I'll finish by answering yes or no, as happens at France at determined periods of history, and generally on Sundays. In the, it's in these terms that I propose to read the prospects for transcending capital in the 21st century. I take as grounds the already present possibilities for transcendence, and locate a politics of emancipation in <coughs> reading and acting on the situation as it is. The first half of the paper offers a reading of Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, in which I stress the moments of transcendence from within that exist in this work, but are generally missed because of the, in readings of his book, because of the effort to take a position safely inside or outside his book. The crucial matter is the kind of orientation that one has to a book such as Piketty's, and to economics more generally. And also with this, the kind of orientation that we might have to capital, uh, and its representation more generally. Maintaining with Piketty that the transcendence of capital from within is again today on the cards, the second half of the paper therefore turns to the question of where the transcendence of capital in the 21st century might reside. On a casual reading, whether made in one's dressing gown or an evening dress, or if one were to take up the many easy opinions circulating in the media, Piketty's book might be taken to have little to say to either the gritty demands of social movements or the heady heights of radical philosophy. The book can, after all, be read as attractive depoliticising policy advice, advi uh, proposing nothing more than a centrally administered tax increase that all well-meaning progressives already support and that none in power would in any way countenance. Here I want to argue against this reading, not so much in order to defend Piketty, but rather to propose a relation between social movements, economics and philosophy that is not premised on relations of externality, division and separation. Let us be clear that there are immediate challenges for radical philosophers and for activists reading Piketty's book, not least of which is the utterly improbable way in which Piketty treats Marx. 
The critique of Piketty's reading of Marx is, of course, incredibly easy, and so I should get this out of the way quickly so that we can move on to more serious matters. In brief, Piketty conceives capital in a shallow and banal way, equating all forms of wealth with capital and therefore deriving any ability to discriminate wealth from, for instance, industrial or financial capital. Marx is travestied in what Piketty calls the principle of infinite accumulation, against which Piketty might well have actually consulted what Marx wrote about the general law of capitalist accumulation. Against almost every moment in Marx's text, uh, he stands accused of assuming zero productivity and uh, growth in the long run. Marx is accused by Piketty of taking a rather impressionistic and a fairly anecdotal and unsystematic approach to the available statistics by an author whose own demonstrated knowledge of Marx's writings is anecdotal at best and seems to have not even the slightest inkling of the meaning of terms such as primitive accumulation. Need we say more? I have no interest in defending Piketty here. Indeed, much that is critical could be levelled against the book. My goal, rather, is to invite critics of capitalism <coughs> out of their hiding behind an abstract model of a mysterious capitalism to turn instead to the realities of intervention against that capitalism which are already underway. Indeed, the critique of Piketty's reading of Marx could easily occupy one so much that this would eclipse everything else in this book and indeed would stand in for the critique of capital. For historical materialism, the target is not critical criticism of books and ideas, but is rather the principled intervention in the actual world. So whatever other conclusions we might come to about Piketty, let it not be forgotten for a second what our target of criticism is. Neither should it be forgotten that even beyond the stark reality that Marx is indeed the most regularly cited person in the book, Marx, or at least a certain phantom of Marx, <coughs> is indeed the principal theoretical interlocutor of Piketty's book. Piketty's book <coughs> begins and ends with questions regarding the intellectual and political terrain on which debate around the distribution of wealth takes place. He stresses that this debate has long been based on an abundance of prejudice and a paucity of fact, and he bemoans the intellectual laziness of both sides. His sources are statistical, to be sure, but are also theoretical and are far from restricted to economics. He argues that the problem of inequality is a problem for the social sciences in general, not just for one of its disciplines. Rather, and here I do quote at length, the truth is that economics should never have sought to divorce itself from the other social sciences and can only advance in conjunction with them. The social sciences collectively know too little to waste time on foolish disciplinary squabbles. If we are to progress in our understanding of the historical dynamics of the wealth distribution and structure of social classes, we must obviously take a pragmatic approach and avail ourselves of the methods of historians, sociologists and political scientists as well as econ economists. Disciplinary disputes and turf wars are of little or no importance. End quote. Piketty also challenges the division of intellectual from political life and concludes that it is illusory, I believe, to think that the scholar and the citizen live in separate moral universes. Further, he argues, it is all too easy for social scientists to remove themselves from public debate and political confrontation and content themselves with the role of commentators on or demolishers of the views and data of others. Social scientists, he says, like all intellectuals and all citizens, ought to participate in public debate. He calls for the intersection of all social scientists, all journalists and commentators, all activists in the unions and in politics of whatever stripe, especially all citizens. I mean, in Piketty, in his own practice, he, he writes regularly for... Um, uh, for major French newspapers, Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, Liberation, and so forth, um, as well as his practical interventions in, in party politics in, uh, in France. Um, I don't want to talk about the practical interventions, but really kind of stay focused on, on the book, which is the thing at hand. Piketty... Um, OK. By this, it should be clear that Piketty refuses in advance the separation of the disciplines from one another and the acclaimed separation from politics and their own material conditions. It's exactly in this spirit that I'm proposing here to read Piketty alongside philosophy and the demands of social movements. Taking social movements first, these arrive to fill in what would otherwise 
be noticed as a glaring gap in his analysis, which relates to that effective force towards social change in the absence of mechanical, social or economic determination. Attentive readers will surely wonder why elites and the systems of global governance that have been oriented towards their interests over recent years would so quickly agree to the demands for extensive new progressive taxation on a global scale. Recall his proposal. Piketty is proposing, recall, a top tax on income of more than 80%, a progressive global annual tax on individual wealth of around 5% on the largest fortunes, perhaps 10% annually, or higher on the wealth of billionaires, to which is added an immediate exceptional tax of, for example, 15% on all private wealth globally in order to immediately eliminate uh, sovereign debt. This is the kind of, you know, why this would come about becomes a problem, right? <laughs> Piketty certainly does not see this as an automatic process, nor as one that will come about without resistance. Readers of David Harvey will at this point also be recalling Harvey's injunction, the accumulation of capital will never cease, it will have to be stopped. The capitalist class will never willingly surrender its power, it will have to be dispossessed. Piketty is clear that the countervailing forces against the massive concentration of wealth will be concerted collective action, and that the presently constituted state presents serious obstacles towards that action. This is in part due to the persistence of the very idea of the nation-state, and specifically due to the functioning of the European Union. Further, Piketty inquires as to whether the US political process has been captured by the 1%. Piketty does not, however, immediately eschew the state, nor does he automatically leap to taxation as his solution. He treats in some detail the prospect of deliberately induced inflation in order to eliminate the sovereign debt situation and uh, to devalue privately held wealth. He emphasises the historical novelty of inflation in the 20th century and the role that inflation played in destroying debt. This is a fact well known to liberal and neoliberal economists and therefore, uh, Piketty's strategy of pre presenting the inflation card, even though he doesn't play it, is a carefully calculated move. Rather than inflation, however, which brings with it its own dangers and only arbitrarily redistributes wealth, Piketty turns to tax, although not a tax on income so much as a tax on wealth, which, as he notes, has always been and increasingly is much more radically uh, unequally distributed than income. Tax is also preferred by Piketty to the physical destruction of wealth that equalised fortunes as a result of the two great wars of the first half of the 20th century. Can we imagine, he says, a 21st century in which capitalism will be transcended in a more peaceful and more lasting way, or must we simply await the next crisis or the next war, this time a truly global one? Elsewhere, he gives the answer to this rhetorical question. He writes, I remain optimistic and I dream always of a rational and peaceful overcoming of capitalism. He stresses, adding the force of decision between alternatives, we must decide. Many people, he says, will reject the global tax on capital as a dangerous illusion, just as the income tax was rejected in its own time, a little more than a century ago. Recall income tax were a novelty at the end of the uh, 19th century. When looked at more closely, however, he says, this solution, the tax solution, turns out to be far less dangerous than the alternatives. What is this danger he is alluding to? Among the dangerous alternatives is the <coughs> prospect of doing nothing about the concentration of wealth and the increased and increasing inequality that has expanded globally since the 1970s. <coughs> Absent forces to the contrary, Piketty demonstrates how these levels of concentration and inequality will soon return to level, the levels present at the beginning of the 20th century, and that these trends will accelerate in the context of continuing returns on established wealth and slowing global economic growth. Uh, this uh, kicked in from the 60s, but is continuing and projected into the 21st century by most economists. Hence the formula R is greater than G, has got a great formula in the book, which expresses this tendency of the rate of return on capital to be greater than the rate of economic growth, and with this, the incrementally but exponentially increasing inequality of wealth over time. For Piketty, the thing that is endangered by rampant inequality is democracy. And with this, the danger of inequality to capital 
is the prospect of uprising by those most affected by it. Democracy, it should be noted, is for Piketty not adequately represented by any regime of technocratic governance or depoliticised administration. These strip out the prospect for collective deliberation and are thus fundamentally in conflict with democracy. Expert analysis will never put an end, he writes, to the violent political conflict that inequality inevitably instigates. Efforts to put an end to that political conflict fundamentally pose a threat to democracy, the nature of which, he argues, is conflictual. Political conflict being on the side of democracy, it follows that for Piketty, democracy will never be supplemented by a republic of experts, and that is a good thing. In this light, it is perhaps unsurprising that Piketty describes Jacques Rancière's attitude towards democracy as indispensable. In a series of works, Rancière has argued for the foundational place of disagreement in politics, that the founding act of politics is depoliticisation. And for this reason, there is a, a, a basic and foundational hatred of democracy that recoils in horror at the prospect of the expressions of desire of the people. I think if you live in this country, you will know what this means. It's important to recall Rancière's insistence that democracy is an unruly demand, but moreover, one that since the Greeks has been despised by elites, who have always been the ones who have hated democracy. In Piketty's framing, which targets both ideology and its ideologists, no hypocrisy is too great when economic and financial elites are obliged to defend their interests, and that includes economists who currently occupy an enviable place in the US income hierarchy. Piketty's book displays numerous important resonances with Rancière's work, both explicitly and implicitly. This is clear in Piketty's challenging of disciplinary boundaries and his frequent evocations of Jane Austen and Honoré de Balzac, which echoes the even more daring movements that Rancière makes between workers' history, philosophy, aesthetics, political theory and literature. For Rancière, this very movement of the generic without specific object is the basis of democracy. Without this kind of context, it becomes difficult to understand, in the context of particular of Rancière, it becomes difficult to understand exactly how and why it is that Piketty dis distances himself from one particular form of Marxism. To some, it will come as absolutely no surprise that one of the major conclusions that arises from Piketty's historical data uh, is that the first is that one should be wary of any economic determinism in regard to inequality of wealth and income. This articulates with the critique of a certain type of Marxism that Rancière associated above all with Louis Althusser and with Pierre Bourdieu. Against the inca this incapacitating Marxism, we find in Rancière an insistence on the capacity of those who are considered most incapable. He emphasises what is possible when nothing is considered possible and provides a critique of the excessive focus on domination. Hence Rancière's argument that the task of criticism is not the endless demonstration of the omnipotence of the beast. Piketty, likewise, sees nothing natural or inevitable about inequality. The demand for equality is a social demand that can be and is made by particular groups in relation to others, for whom there is no natural spontaneous process to prevent destabilising inegalitarian forces from, from prevailing permanently. Just as Rancière finds uh, politics in the most seemingly minor acts, Piketty is clear about the stakes of taxation. Thus he writes, Taxation is not a technical issue. It is preeminently a political and philosophical issue, perhaps the most important of all political issues. Without taxes, he writes, society has no common destiny and collective action is impossible. Among the dangers of not elaborating a global tax on capital, Piketty evokes the risks of the formation of a new oligarchy, and with this new forms of totalitarianism, rising non-democratic forms of capitalism, and of capitalist authoritarianism. We see these globally in a number of different countries. I'm not just thinking of Turkey and China, but we see these globally, Russia as well, capitalist uh, totalitarianism. If these uh, threats, as seen by elites, and in particular threats to the idea that capitalism is inherently democratic, then these are also threats from the other side. These are threats in the form of revolutionary challenges to capitalism as such, 
And this is not the first time that Piketty speaks of in the language of revolution. He writes, if, for example, the top decile, the top 10%, appropriates 90% of each year's output, and the top centile took uh, 50% just for itself, as in the case of wealth, a revolution will li likely occur. Unless some peculiarly effective repressive apparatus exists to keep it from happening. When it comes to the ownership of capital, such a high degree of concentration is already a source of powerful political tensions, which are often difficult to reconcile with universal suffrage. Piketty is very clear then about the place of force and consent, what are known as repressive and ideological apparatuses in the maintenance of inequality. It is impossible, he writes, to maintain extreme inequalities I quote, unless there is a particularly effective system of repression or an extremely powerful apparatus of persuasion, or perhaps both. I quote again, indeed, whether such extreme inequality is or is not sustainable depends not only on the effectiveness of the repressive apparatus, but also, and perhaps primarily, on the effectiveness of the apparatus of justification. If inequalities are seen as justified, say, because they are seen to be a consequence of a choice by the rich to work harder or more efficiently than the poor, or because preventing the rich from earning more would inevitably harm the worst-off members of society, then it is perfectly possible for the concentration of income to set new historical records. I want to insist on this point. The key issue is the justification of inequality, he says, rather than its magnitude as such. Against these justifications of inequality, Piketty presents what is possible. Again, the consistency of Piketty with Ronciere is remarkable. For Ronciere, uh, this is what a process of political subjectivation consists in. The action of uncounted capacities that crack open the unity of the given and the obviousness of the visible in order to sketch a new topography of the possible. Ronciere stresses throughout his work the fact of bodies existing in the places where they are not supposed to be. This is actual. This is happening. There are spaces in the midst of what is otherwise taken as an impossible situation. Therefore, his formula, it is possible. The whole ideological struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat is played out there. The only song the bourgeoisie has ever sung to the workers is the song of their impotence of the impossibility for things to be different than they are, or in any case, of the workers' inability to change them. Tax on wealth for Piketty is not an abstract idea which is projected into the future, but rather he demonstrates various forms of capital taxation already exist in most countries, especially in North America and Europe, and these could obviously serve as starting points. He adds that the capital controls that exist in China and in other emerging countries also hold uh, useful lessons for all. He again stresses that the obstacles are not technical, even if they might be presented as such. Thus, he argues that the technical solution is within reach. On the gritty details of implementation, for instance, he writes, the capital tax would work in the same way as income tax currently does in many countries where data on income are provided to the tax authorities by employers. Piketty often evokes the historical example of taxation in the United States, and he stresses that for many years taxes in the United States were considerably higher than they were in Europe. He identifies how these taxes were articulated with ideas of merit, and how for many years there was lower inequality in the United States than elsewhere, and that this did not hinder economic growth. Further, as other critics of austerity, critics of austerity such as Piketty point out, this is not a matter of there not being enough money. The question of redistribution is about what to do with what there is. The national wealth of Europe, he stresses, has never been so high. The nations of Europe have never been so rich. Okay, that was the easy part, sorry. <laughs> part two. No, I'm actually not joking. In, um, in a short text uh, called Absolute Imminence, Giorgio Agamben contrasts a line of imminence from a line of transcendence. On the side of transcendence, he positions Kant and Husserl. On the side of imminence, 
Spinoza and Nietzsche. These two paths, Kant and Spinoza, meet in Heidegger and then diverge again with uh, Levinas and Derrida on the side of transcendence and Deleuze and Foucault on the side of immanence. This kind of categorization clearly raises as many questions as it answers. First of all, in the way in which it uh, elides a missing third term at the starting point of Kant and Spinoza, who is, of course, Hegel, the great reader of both, who subjected both Kant and Spinoza to imminent critique. One of the many reasons for the importance of Hegel for radical philosophy and radical politics today is his refusal of this alternative, imminence or transcendence. His position on this is well known, or at least should be well known. Against the various traditions that have turned difference into separation, Hegel insists on the demonstrable reality of the unity of opposites. And he does this in a way that equally resists undifferentiated abstract flat holism. Flat ontology, it's it's talked about in, in contemporary circles, this new form of flat spinosism. Among contemporary thinkers who seek to uh, think transcendence and imminence together, perhaps none are as important nor as full of contradictions as Alain Badiou. I will not seek here to pretend that Badiou's attempt to deal with the problem of imminence is complete or consistent, either in principle or in elaboration. Peter Hallwood, amongst others, has identified serious problems with Badiou's position on imminence, and in particular has demonstrated the consequences of this for his conception of politics. I should stress the fractured character of Badiou's thought on imminence, and equally the fact that, at the same time, there are many resources in Badiou's thought that can offer a remedy for these problems. I will show this shortly. I want to draw attention in particular to Badiou's critique of otherworldly moralism, which can solve Badiou's otherworldly moralism. Um, my concern is not with the integrity or purity of the thought of Badiou or anyone else, but rather for what it can offer in terms of an orientation toward capital in the 21st century. The question of imminence um, occupies a central place in Badiou's most recent work no doubt in response to critical questions raised by Hallwood and others about the seemingly transcendent appearance of truths in his early and above all his middle period. Imminence takes centre stage in his forthcoming Imminence of Truths, uh, the book which will be the third and final part of the Being an Event series, and has been at the heart of his seminars since at least 2012. We have a participant in the seminar series right in the front here. Uh, you can listen to the seminars on the, uh, the, the website of the École Normale Superior. This, um, nevertheless, the question of transcend uh, transcendence from within the situation, which in his most recent teaching he describes as imminent exception, has o occupied Badiou throughout his work. This conception is crucial, and even if Badiou has himself been far from consistent in thinking through this relation of imminent exception, then the difficulties that his position encounters are, I believe, instructive. At his best, <coughs> Badiou maintains the internal relation between situation and event. The classic formulation of this appears in Being an Event, where Badiou seeks to grasp what needs to be thought of the nature of being for there to be the possibility of something genuinely new arising out of an existing situation. On the conception defended there, there is no pure event. Change always takes place at the edge of the situation, at the undecidable border of a situation. This is a recurrent reminder in Badiou's thinking when he challenges the thematics of absolute commencement. A change cannot be an absolute change, he says in his more recent teaching, this is a very important point. A change is always a change somewhere. It is a change in a situation. In being an event, Badiou calls the problem of seeing changes arising from the purity of an outside, he calls this speculative leftism. And importantly, he connects the problem of speculative leftism, as some of us used to call this utopian socialism in the past. Yeah. He importantly connects the problem of speculative leftism with pure willing willing for things to be different, pure desire that things would be different. As he writes, we can term speculative leftism, he says, any thought of being which bases itself upon the theme of an absolute commencement. 
Speculative leftism imagines that intervention authorizes itself on the basis of itself alone. Speculative leftism imagines that intervention authorizes itself on the basis of itself alone, that it breaks with the situation without any other support than its own negative will. End quote. Insofar as Badiou himself refuses the temptation of speculative leftism, he finds that real change comes not purely from willing or demanding it, but from an encounter with the situation which is not reducible to the situation. In this ongoing dialectic, which has been forcefully articulated by Bruno Bostiles, this is precisely a mode of thinking that does not seek to distinguish being on the one hand from event on the other hand, but rather to articulate them together within one and the same plane. For being an event to coexist, this involves positing the existence of elements taken not to exist, and furthermore involves calling into question the presupposed stability and consistence of a situation. It involves asserting the existence of the inexistent, and with this, Badiou's central axiom of the non-being of the one. Non-being of the one. The one is not all. This apparently abstract metaphysical axiom is taken by Badiou as the grounds for his refutation of metaphysics. Given that, recall, metaphysics is defined by Badiou as the commandeering of being by the one. Badiou does not draw these ideas from nothing, but rather he takes them from that void of negativity which is Hegel's logic. In the science of logic, we find the infamous equation of being and nothing. And with this, the imminence of the other to any determinate being. The equation of being and nothing, the imminence of the other to any determinate being. Badiou is clear about this lineage from Hegel to himself. With Hegel, he says, the negation of a thing is imminent to that thing, but at the same time exceeds it, transcends it, they pass. <coughs> The kernel of the dialectic, he says elsewhere, is the status of the negation of an operator which separates as it includes. Elsewhere, discussing the core of the dialectic, he says, In Hegel, the negation of a thing is imminent to this thing, but at the same time it goes beyond the thing. This negation exists, that negation exists on the inside, is precisely why Hegel argues against an abstract ought that would impose itself from the outside. He argues against simply willing that things be different, which ends up positioning the possible in the otherworldly and putting everything on the side of the subjective will. He rails against, I quote, that kind of understanding which takes the dreams of its abstractions for something true and which insists pretentiously on the ought which it likes to prescribe, especially in the sphere of politics, as if the world has been waiting for this to learn how it ought to be, but isn't. Echoing the remarks from, his, uh, from the phenomenology which I cited, uh, cited above, in his lectures on logic, he formalises it like this, it is far easier to say what ought to be than to say what is. Although Hegel will have nothing of the idea of immediate knowledge of things via unmediated sense perception, he praises the great principle that he finds in empiricism. Like empiricism, Hegel says, philosophy too only knows what is. It does not know what only ought to be, and thus is not there. Through his work, Hegel returns again and again to this problem. This generally appears in his rejection of the moralism of the ought that is opposed to the actual. Shall I complicate it? <laughs> he adds another twist there's a further twist in the science of logic we don't need to go necessarily into detail on this but he gives it a further twist in the science of logic in which he identifies the divided nature of the ought there he writes what ought to be is and at the same time is not if it were it would not be what merely ought to be this pure willing that things be different is thus always caught in what is called in psychoanalysis the drive as Hegel anticipates the theory of the drive, as he puts it, the will in itself requires that its purpose not be realized. In the phenomenology, we'll end the uh, complications, back to the simple part. Uh, 
In the phenomenology, Hegel characterizes the, this ultimately moral point of view that seeks purity as a standpoint from which to criticize this world. He characterizes this as the unhappy consciousness, which he associates with the Stoics. As he explains the principles of the Stoics in his lectures on the history of philosophy, um, I quote, its implication, the, the pr implication of the principle of the Stoics, is not that the condition of the world should be rational and just, but only that the subject should maintain its inner freedom. Hence, everything that takes place outside, all that is in the world, every circumstance of the sort, takes on a merely negative status, as are the Afron, uh, uh, indifferent, which I relinquish, so I, I stand outside that world which is uh, perverse. This unhappy consciousness returns, Hegel shows, in refined form in the moral criticism of the impurity of the world on the basis of the way that it fails, up to live how it, with, live, it fails to live up to how it ought to be. Such moral criticism, which Hegel associates above all with the, the morality of Kant and Fichte, can be, I hope you can see this is widespread today. It divides itself from the world for the reason of the world's corruption. Thought then remains on the side of a perfectly moral, beautiful soul, while actuality and worldliness appear only negatively. This moral consciousness, he writes in the Phenomenology, lacks the force to relinquish itself. It lacks the force to make itself into a thing and to suffer the burden of being. It lives with the anxiety that it will stain the glory of its inwardness by means of action and existence. Thus, to preserve the purity of its heart, it flees from contact with actuality and it steadfastly preserves itself in its obstinate powerlessness to renounce its own self, a self which has been intensified to the final point of abstraction. It persists in its powerlessness to give itself substantiality, that is, to transform its thought into being and to commit itself to this absolute distinction, thought and being. This is precisely the position that Badiou criticised in Being an Event as speculative leftism, and earlier in his theory of the subject as the option of resignation resulting from the fact that on the base of, basis of the conclusion that we are in a ruinous and thoughtless epoch, one might take the position of withdrawing from it completely. This is an ethics that is grounded in neither praise of the situation nor resignation to it, but is rather what Badiou calls an ethics of discordance, which recognises that the situation is not all, but takes a negative or nihilistic stance, a position that touches on anxiety, which knows that it touches upon the real only through what he calls the inconsolable loss of the dead world. Against this ethics of discordance, Badiou defends a Promethean ethics, grounded in confidence in and affirmation of the concrete and actual possibilities that exist within but are, unencountered, are unaccounted for by the situation. If this is a politics of the impossible, then this is a politics that demonstrates that the impossible is in fact quite possible and that it is already taking place. In this context, it is crucial to grasp the status of the there is which Badiou will assert regarding the status of something taken to, non -exist, uh, to not exist. This there is of the apparently absent runs through all of Badiou's work, something, but, uh, something uh, which is often but not always schematized as the inexistent. In Logics of Worlds, this is the except there are truths that threatens to interrupt any world. It is also clearly the motif of Badiou's practical politics that starts from the there is of present living and working bodies. In, for instance, the fourth of his analyses of our circumstances, the first book on Sarkozy, Badiou writes, There exist in our midst women and men who, although they live and work here like anyone else, are considered all the same to have come from another world. Again, this there is in Badiou does not come out of thin air. In Can Politics Be Thought, Badiou presents the there is as the ground of Marx's politics. For Marx, Badiou writes, the point of departure is there is a revolutionary workers' movement. That is, there is a subject that presents as obstacle where it unbinds itself. It is a pure there is, a real. It is with respect to this there is, Badiou says, that Marx advances this or that thesis. So in this book, the Can Politics Be Thought, 
Bad Jew divides Marx from Hegel and then splits Hegel from within in order that he might return, arguing that Hegel was an obligatory reference point, although he surely did not uh, furnish either the principle of the formulation of the there is, nor the rule of political engagement. Proposing a rereading of Hegel, Badiou argues, the referent of Marxism's acquisitions, Hegel theoretically, must be dismembered, disarticulated, re-established, something I've already done, you probably sense, so as to participate in his way in the contemporary designation of the there is, which is at its starting point, because brought back to the foundational hypothesis, there is an ordered political capacity to non-domination. Readers of Bad Jew will be well aware that this foundational hypothesis, there is an ordered political capacity to non-domination, will appear repeatedly through his work. Later, it is formulated as the generic version of the communist hypothesis, that the logic of class, the fundamental subordination of labour to a dominant class, the arrangement which has persisted since antiquity, this is not inevitable. It can be overcome. This there is, that is irreducible to Hegel, finds echoes across the record of the French Revolution. In the pamphlet of Emmanuel C.A.S. of January 1789, we read, What is the third estate? Everything. What until now has it been in the existing political order? Nothing. What does it want to be? Something. It's absolutely no coincidence that Piketty cites this slogan, the slogan of the French Revolution. Nor that Piketty draws attention to the continuity between the slogan and Occupy. He, in fact, says you can only understand Occupy with a context of that slogan. It is also no coincidence that this slogan reappears in the first stanza of the, the International, of the song, The International, which is first written in 1871. We are nothing, let us be all. Nor is it a coincidence that this motif recurs throughout Badiou's work. For example, in Logics of Worlds, we learn of the inexistent projected into existence, the inner parent that shines within being. He proposes uh, another formulation. I quote, A body is composed of all the elements of the sight that subordinate themselves with maximal intensity to that which was nothing and becomes all. Badiou is certainly right that these acquisitions do not come from Hegel alone. In the introduction to his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right of 1843-44, Marx explicitly introduces this motif from the French Revolution and Occupy and the International as a counterpoint that rubs up against Hegel and moreover against the situation of thought in Germany of the years following the French Revolution. Marx therefore paraphrases C.A.S., and praises him as that genius which can raise material force to the level of political power. The revolutionary boldness, he says, which flings into the face of its adversary the defiant words, I'm nothing, I shall be everything. This demand for the right to exist of what already exists is of course not foreign to Hegel, to a certain Hegel, to a dismembered Hegel, and remains central to Marx throughout. In his youth, then, Marx wrote, we do not anticipate the world with our dogmas, but instead attempt to discover the new world through the critique of the old. Hitherto, philosophers have left the keys to all riddles lying in their desks, and the stupid, uninitiated world had only to wait around for the roasted pigeons of absolute science to fly into its open mouths. From this polemical starting point and his training in Hegel, Marx commences to undertake an imminent critique of capital, that runs across the three volumes of Capital, the voluminous notes of the Grundrisse and the extensive commentary on the political economists of his day that occupies the theories of surplus value. It is the fact of a there is that he uses to disconfirm the pleasantries of elites that finds the manifesto open with the reality that European uh, powers already recognise communism as a power in its own right. In the inaugural address of 1864, he starts out from the great fact of the misery of the working classes. In 1871, the year, after the, or the year of the Commune, he writes, the great social measure of the Commune was its own working existence. The existence of the Commune was the fact. It's against 
It was against abstract moralis moralistic dreaming that Hegel wrote in the f philosophy of right. What is rational is actual, and what is actual is rational. Domenico Lesordo notes in his fine book on Hegel that in his scathing critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, Marx does not even mention this phrase. And Lesordo stresses that the claim of the rationality of the actual is by no means outside traditional revolutionary thought. Thus, Lesordo's important argument that the assertion of the rationality of the actual is not a rejection of change, but its anchor in the objective dialectic of the actual. It is probably useful for us to recall that in the final version of the Encyclopedia Logic of 1830, Hegel returns to this phrase, the rational is actual, actual is the rational, and adds by way of explanation, who would not have enough good sense to see much around him which is indeed not as it should be? He concludes, philosophical science deals solely with the idea which is not so impotent that it merely ought to be actual. I may conclude. I take Hegel's remarks to be equally relevant to the question of how to read Piketty's Capital in the 21st century as they are to the broader question of how to read capital in the 21st century. Indeed, the two matters which I've so far uh, presented in turn, or at least seem to present in turn, are not so distinct as they may seem. If we are today here in search of a political subject, and if, as Badiou says, a subject is both a principle of differentiation, the level of the individual, the determinate individual, and globally a principle of orientation towards a truth procedure, and these questions of orientation towards works of economics, such as Piketty's, and towards current structures of capital and state, are pressing questions for radical philosophy and for social movements. This may be obvious to some of you. If, if it is, I'm sorry to have laboured you. Piketty's work performs many of the moments of a dialectical overcoming from within that, as we've seen again, are an indispensable part of the radical tradition. That Piketty's project could belong to the radical tradition while its key, at its key moments departs from it or even explicitly disowns it strategically need to be taken as symptoms of an opening. Piketty opens a series of doors even if he himself doesn't go through all of them. At times for the reason of evoking traditional, traditionalistic even lines of separation. Thus for instance, in the final note to the capital in the 21st century, we read the following. When one reads philosophers, he says, such as Jean-Paul Sartre, Louis Althusser, and Alain Badiou, on their Marxist and or communist commitments, one sometimes has the impression that questions of capital and class inequality are of only modest interest to them, and serve mainly as a pretext for jousts of a different nature entirely. This comment by Piketty should be read very carefully as an important critical moment for radical philosophers and for activists in terms of their connections with the already existing. It is certainly the case that Badgie drifts into the abstract distance when he writes, for instance, I quote, true critique of the world today, Badgie says, cannot boil down to the academic critique of the capitalist economy. Nothing is easier, he says, more abstract and useless than the critique of capitalism itself. Those who make a loud noise of, in this critique are always lead to wise reforms of capitalism. They propose a regulated and comfortable capitalism, a non-pornographic capitalism, an ecological and always more democratic capitalism. They demand a capitalism more comfortable for all. In some, Badiou says, capitalism with a human face. End quote. So when Badiou concludes that the only dangerous and radical critique is the political critique of democracy, he has exited the orbit of anything that can reasonably be called materialism. This, I believe, is a terrible shame because philosophers such as Badiou have a great deal to offer in elaborating and extending the work of economists such as Piketty. Piketty himself admits that much of the battle ahead is not technical but is ideological. And in this light, there is a crucial importance in Badiou's insistence on struggles in the realm of thought and above all, against all the currents of today, Badiou's insistence that one can have and one can live for an idea.
<coughs> against the placeholders Piketty and Badiou, and moreover, against their separation, I've been trying to draw out a common relation to the overcoming of capital as the problem for radical philosophy and social movements in the 20th century, 21st century. The overcoming of capital in the 21st century. This is our thing in itself. Recall the principle that Hegel stresses from the beginning to the end of the science of logic, the value of the first demand on thought. This is what Plato demanded of cognition, he says, that it should consider things in and for themselves, he writes. This is a demand that it should not stray away from them while it grasps at circumstances, examples and comparisons, but on the contrary should keep only them in view before it and bring to consciousness what is imminent in them. Such a position, afraid neither of the labour of statistics nor the labour of the concept, takes bodies where they are rather than where they merely ought to be. To read capital in the 21st century means to see those bodies that exist where they are supposed to not exist and the capacities of those who are supposed to not be capable. Of course, there is always a policing operation which chases bodies back into their places. This is an operation to which Roncier gives the classic formula, move along, there's nothing to see here. In the tradition, in our tradition, and regarding the reception of large books, we might recall the very concern on the part of Marx and Engels on the publication of Volume 1 of Capital in 1867, which was not so much that the book would be subject to criticism and elaboration, but rather that it would be variously received with idle chatter and silence. This is the policing operation that always seeks to put radical thought and that which is radical in thought back in its place. I'm stressing here that capital always faces bodies that are not in the places where they ought to be and that Thomas Piketty's is one of these bodies. The good thing about negativity is that it is not something that needs to be introduced to the situation from the outside. Our situation, our situation like every other one, is marked by radical negativity. Badiou's point is that the inexistent exists. That which is not, is. Those who are nothing are something. To this, I'm stressing with Ronciere that people are already doing what they're not supposed to do and that depoliticisation and capture are always secondary to mobilisation, manifestation. To register these mobilisations and to show them in their logic certainly exercises us today. This involves an attunement of one's senses and the senses of others which does not see only the story of domination, but rather its incompleteness, the things that are breaking through. If one looks beyond this island, indeed if one looks within it, one faces a seething sea. Negativity need not be introduced from the outside by, for instance, a critical or a moral conscience. Rather, present efforts at pacification need to be confronted directly these include all the efforts that would corral disruption so that it runs in separate channels that never connect with one another. For the scholar and the activist, this is the lesson of what it means to orient oneself to the other. A difference which does not separate, singularity in the unity of opposites. The other does not need to be invented or created, but is right here in our midst. Beyond denial is a registering of the other that is already at work, right there on the inside. And not invisible awaiting our salvation, but they're struggling for the right to exist, demanding that all are equally free, not merely in the abstract, but in the concrete. To read capital in the 21st century then requires that one read Piketty, and a few others. Because one will find that capital is not what it is often taken to be. That capital is not all, the one is not that is riven through with that which is other to it, is again not something we need to say from the outside. The alarm bells are ringing in the economics faculty, while well-dressed assistants are scrambling to find the off switch. It's August 2014. The World Economic Forum and the OECD have just released reports alarmed at inequality and what it describes as the present social crisis. Earlier this month, Credit Ratings Agency Standard & Poor's published a report which concludes, A rising tide lifts all boats, 
but a lifeboat carrying a few, surrounded by many treading waters, uh, water, risks capsizing. Radicals of the world read capital in the 21st century because the economists need us. <laughs> Some of the stuff you're working on, so obviously you take just a few sort of uh, streams of what you're saying, definitely working in sort of like ontology, ontological areas, or maybe if I take a, come at it from a bit more of a psychological or emotional uh, approach and then apply that to social movements. Yep. So, you know, looking at the question of what is possible and, and, and drawing forth this particular possible way of looking at the world, which is a, a sort of like an all or nothing way of looking, a distancing, a disengagement, uh, maybe a sense of hopelessness, which seems to be embodied in that idea of the un unhappy consciousness. And I'm hearing or interpreting perhaps this in terms of, but this is something, this is a, a stream that's present in Western culture, that is present in some forms of Left-wing thought, and perhaps also within social movements. Definitely, you gave the example at the end of people sort of uh, falling for sort of minor reforms, but I sort of open the possibility that maybe also exists among people and even radical reforms as well. Um, so the question then for me is sort of what is at risk in that way of thinking, and the, what comes up for me in that is is that we're not persuasive in social movements, that if we're stuck in that way, then we're not drawing people in to the social movements, that we're unsuccessful because of that, that perhaps also we, we're prone to burnout because of the way in which we're distancing ourselves, not engaging, and perhaps also it might feed into not being able to engage with other people within the social movement. Um, maybe my thoughts there is just opening up, so... The other, the other possibility, what, what are the other possibilities? Because that sense of hopelessness is understandable. You know, that response to, uh, you know, you take it back. I mean, climate change is a, an area that I worked on, and that's sort of thing there. That sense of hopelessness is a real, uh, it's a real risk. And how we engage with that, and that maybe as activists or people involved in movements, that to somehow that hopelessness can coexist with a form of active hope and that's not perhaps opposites and that that maybe despair can have a place and so sort of moving forward. I don't know, how does that interact with what we've been speaking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose, and um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, and I'm kind of, in a way, implicitly I'm saying that, um, you know, if we want to involve if we want to be involved in radical change, we need to think about these basic ontological questions of our changes and that's why bad you is important, right? In contemporary thought, in contemporary radical thought, because he reminds us of that kind of thing. I suppose what I'm arguing in, in the simplest way is to say, um, it's not that the world is bad. The world is conflicted. Right? And so if we just cast the world as bad, then we'll forever complain about it. And we won't see, and that's the danger, we won't see what's already happening there, which is, which is exciting, radically possible. Right? And that's the psychological element of what I'm drawing to, drawing, trying to draw attention to with that stoic idea of the unhappy consciousness, the beautiful soul. And yes, I do think it characterises um, a, n a number of movements, social movements and, and folk on the left. Right? And of course, with that, there are dangers beyond just the psychological thing. And I want to say, it's satisfying. Right? There's something really satisfying about knowing that you're good and the world is bad. That's the psychological thing that's important in what Hegel shows us. Right? It's really satisfying. Because then you'll never get dirty by the world that's out there. Right? Bad Jew's point, politics is failure, right? And if you've ever tried to do anything effectively, you'll know. If you fail all the time, you get, you get smashed up, and there will usually be a bunch of beautifully untouched academics standing on the side. Oh, don't you know that you could have done... Really? Yeah, who, who were never doing anything, those academics generally, right? Because they are the beautiful souls. They are, yeah? And, and they are the ones I'm calling. And so far as we're in the university space here, I'm saying to those academics, you know, that... that get involved. And for those of you who are already getting involved, um, involve the others and tell them there is no space outside this. You know? yeah. And with climate change, I think, demonstrates as well. The climate and capital demonstrate. There's no outside, right? You don't, you don't sit outside that. Yeah? Because of the materiality 
of the environment and the environment, the physical environment, the ecology, and the built environment, that is to say, which is stratified according to capital. Because access to the built environment, to the commons, is stratified by, by class. Right? So there's no outside of that. So, um, yeah, and that's the basis as well for, for being much more radically hopeful than the left has been. The other part of it that I'm trying to emphasise, and I maybe wasn't explicit about it, is have an idea, and have an idea about capital. Because if you don't have an idea about capital, you'll end up saying the kind of things that Russell Norman said yesterday. <laughs> have an idea about capital. It is absolutely crucial. Trouble is, he does have an idea about capital, and that's to save it. <laughs> <laughs> to save it. Touche, touche, you're right. <coughs> Uh, yes. I just um, like to really quickly pick up uh, uh, something the gentleman over there said about um, hopelessness. Uh, I don't think it's so much a risk. I actually think it's a very effective strategy of the ruling class. Hopelessness is, is a really good thing to push out there amongst yeah. the uh, proletariat because it means they're not going to try and change yeah. anything. Um, going back to the 70s where there was a, a really big groundswell of, of radical politics and Quite a few crises. It's a groundswell of radical politics now. <laughs> right now. Uh, there is right visible. now. It's not quite as visible. I think that's the problem. That's just what the gentleman over there is saying. It isn't quite as immediate. But there are many crises for the ruling class. Um, and the, the proletariat were quite politicised. There's lots of strikes, there's resistance, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, but at every turn, the, uh, the bourgeoisie was essentially ahead. And they had a, a, a huge regenerative uh, um, capability which always seem to rebut the proletariat in their, in their struggles. That was 40 years ago, and, and I guess what I'd like to ask you is, has that regenerative ability improved? Has it um, slid back? Uh, practically, how, how, how can we tackle that? In my, my position on this is I wouldn't say it's just a matter of 40 years ago. I would say there is always a resistance to capital, and that always comes first. First comes the resistance to capital, and then comes capital. Capital is, um, is, is something, an apparatus of capture. It is a, a negative power that seeks to catch things that are out there amongst the creativity of, of, of human being. Right? It channels and corrals and then seeks to attach to itself the things that are done by other people. That's what wealth does. That's what capital does. Right? So that's not new. That's part of the history of the struggle against capital. And um, you could say that there's been a you could say that there's been a failure over recent over recent years. You could say there's been a weakening, right? But there's also been at the same time a globalization of our struggle. Our struggle today is for a global amongst other things, a global tax on capital. Global, right? And that globalisation of our struggle, uh, following the globalisation of, of, of production and the globalisation of capital with it, is a possibility as much as it is the failure of national state-based uh, politics, right? So we always, if you're on a progressive movement, you've not got... The last thing we need to do is sit around and talk, tell the story. Don't tell the story. We have told the story about how bad neoliberalism is and how it does all these bad things and we are all done for by this great big thing called neoliberalism. That keeps academics happy in publishing stupid articles. <laughs> that is no, of no benefit. We must identify the actually existing possibilities that are actually emerging out of the present situation, including the present situation of finance capital. Finance socialises us, for example. Finance creates new modes of connection between bodies, radically new modes of connection between people. Right? We are much more intimately connected now with people all over the world in all kinds of other situations, mediated through the physical devices that we touch and we use through their work and our work. We are much more connected, much more socialised, and the project is to channel that socialisation into positive new ways. To name it. To say that socialisation which already exists, exists. That's the ontological claim. Which is to say, we exist. And if others can't say it or say it and are constantly told, right? And that's what the, that's what the situation of domination involves. Being dominated and saying, oh, I here, who am lying under this weight, am dominated. I exist. And you're constantly told, no, you don't exist. No, you don't exist. Or you exist marginally. Or you're not given the full right to existence. So, it's always, that's, that's always the struggle against capital. Andrew, uh, Jonathan, and uh, Siba. <coughs> Yes, Andrew. Maybe just a quick point of theory, Campbell, um, to, bring it, to bring it back to theory, because um, I'm a junkie. Um, you mentioned coyly the drive um, in relation, and I'm wondering if maybe picking up on the exact uh, point you just made in relation to existence and the relationship to, to the drives and the movements on the left. 
Where do you see drivers working for or against that? Yeah, okay, so in psychoanalysis, drivers, this repeti satisfying repetition is something that's kind of pathological, kind of not quite right, right? Um, I know I pick my fingernails, but <laughs> nice. I, so don't tell me to stop picking my fingernails. That's not going to cure me, right? That's not the problem. It's nice. Yeah? And yeah, I think, I think that satisfaction of being caught in the drive is, is, is the dangerous and pathological thing because there's something about not finishing it. One doesn't want to finish it. And um, that's what's staying in just the telling what ought to be. Mm -hmm. So exit. Exit the drive. Mm. Just, uh, I don't know, it's not a theory. That's just a political answer, though. But, I mean, the, the theory and political answers are the same, are they not? I mean, the, 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 the ability to move to exit the drive is, is, is the exact <coughs> ontological question, the question of the subject. How yeah. do we exit the drive? Yeah. Mm. And the first thing is to recognise that one's enjoying it, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, then, and then you can, I mean, at a, at, a, at a psychological kind of cure level, kind of in psychoanalysis, like, once I realise that the reason I keep doing this destructive thing is because I kind of enjoy hurting myself, there's a, a compulsion to repeat in which I am enjoying that pain, then... Uh, the one knowing that is at least the possibility for it, and uh, the left should stop hurting itself. Yeah, I'm satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, that involves in practical steps, though, doing doing some other kind of stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. joining forces with other things that are already happening. And what I'm trying to say, there is already this other stuff that's happening. Right? Don't don't feel that the world out there is just hostile. Mm -hmm. Join it. Join the bits of it. You know, it, it means fracturing it, breaking it. It is not all. You know, it's not a one. But it's, it's not just bad. That's what's beautiful. I'm not just talking about the money or two, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes? This, I'm sorry. I'm... All right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We didn't even discuss Lacan. We didn't know that. Yes, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so, it strikes me there's, you know, you approach this question, which I think is a political question, which is... You know, Piketty has a program in you know, politics of uh, you know, global wealth taxes, real high taxes, this kind of thing. Um, and you sort of distinguish it from Badu in relation to this question. Well, you, it seems like you, you sort of pose it in relation to Badu's critique of democracy. Yep. So that, I guess that's one point maybe that I'm interested on if you could elaborate on. Because... I mean, you know, another thing that Badu has been, Badu seminars have been preoccupied with for the past, you know, about 10 years is the question of democracy. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that there, even beyond, you know, Piketty's use of Francia, there's, there's a different conception of democracy which, in Badu, which is where the political, the programmatic difference between Badu's politics and Piketty's politics, I think, lies. So, say in Badu's book, The Rebirth of History, which is probably his most uh, clear programmatic political work of recent times. You know, his political program is, is based around what he calls riots, which is, you know, for him that's the one see these sort of like outbursts of, of you know, let's say political movements, social movements, uh, which are not parliamentary or electoral. Um, yep. And which have their own internal logic, and and that his pro and then he talks about popular dictatorship. Um, yeah. And so he has this program, which is which is not uh, which is not the same as uh, what it seems what what it seems to be Piketty's thing with the global taxes. Okay. Um, and it seems like at, at that point, it's like there are two competing visions, and there's you know what Badu calls communism, whether or not. You would put Piketty into into the discourse of communism. I guess is an interesting question. Um, but that it seems in the end that Piketty's vision perhaps is you know like like Sue said in terms of Russell Norman, Piketty's vision is one in which capitalism is maintained. You know that capitalist social relations are maintained, but they're heavily taxed, which is not the same. You know, which is not the Jews' vision. Okay, of I'll come back to the. Piketty thing in, in terms of whether capital is maintained for, for Piketty. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. And, in a way, it's kind of, it's kind of simple because of how he conceives of capital. Um, on Badu, though, I'll be a little more direct and a bit more blunt. Um, insofar as Badu disavows state politics and disavows democracy, he flirts with, if not entertains, uh, the worst form of speculative uh, leftism. Uh, insofar as Badu 
disdain state politics and um, politics and democracy, he entertains speculative leftism in the worst form. And I think that um, Peter Hallwood is absolutely right in his critique of uh, Badiou to that extent in which Badiou's politics becomes utterly abstract. Moreover, I would stress to this, what he does, which is dangerous, what he, what he, what he needs to rethink is his separation of politics of the state from the politics of civil society. It is the separation of state and civil society that is the target of Marx's critique. The point that Marx makes is that you only need, it is only the state as separate from civil society that needs to wither away. The withering away of the state is its separation from civil society. It's not the state as such. What do we do without governance, right? And I think Badger often entertains, uh, you know, it's just the riots and so forth, right? And I think in doing so, Badger has a very flat, a very 19th century idea of what the state is, right? And I think that we need to learn from what in the 20th century states actually did, not have a homogeneous idea of what the state is, recognise that a number of things were done in the 20th century with the state, and in the 21st century a number of things can be done with a global state that are immensely progressive, immensely progressive. Remember as well, in the 1870s, Marx was very clear, reduction in the length of the working day, these are measures that we, these are not the end of capitalism, but we want them, and we want them now. Marx was clear about that through the 1870s. Practical demands. Of course the end of capitalism is the goal, but let's not dream of it as such a radical outside that we'll never get there. And that's the problem, that's at the heart of the problem with Badger's thought. And that manifests itself more so in a generation of young radical scholars who are brought up on Badger, who consider every engagement with the state to be a matter of dirtying their hands. And I say, don't have unhappy consciousness and mess around on the internet talking about how bad the state is. Get involved. Yeah, that's my kind of point on that. In regard to whether capitalism will end, um, Piketty defines capital as wealth. Now we could complain about that, right? And there are a number of problems, right? And this is a debate that will have to take place because he defines capital just as wealth, right? Now, on the, I want to kind of give up both sides to it, right? In some ways, it's really important and progressive because it identifies forms of wealth that are outside the purview of the traditional Marxist critique of political economy. And so what's called, for example, in recent... Um, what's called in, in recent Marxist political economy the becoming rent uh, of profit, the tendency for... Um, for new forms of rent seeking to emerge alongside capital. This dynamic is quite nicely included within what uh, Piketty describes as capital as uh, wealth, capital as something including wealth, because he points out that financial and industrial capital tend to become grounded in something that will then claim a rent, it tends to be invested in land, with a lower rate of return, but a more secure rate of return, because then that can, will continue forever. And even a low rate of return over a long number of years will multiply enormously. Okay? And then also give other thing, all of the other things he talks about, like mass inheritances, which have become the basis of transmission of wealth today, inheritance and gifting from one generation to another, right? which is part of the exclusion of the youth from, from, from livelihood, from the common. Right? So he does, he does that, and that's in some ways a problem, but in some ways really importantly uh, progressive, because it expands what the critique of wealth is about. So he does speak of the transcending of capitalism. Yeah? Le dépassement du capitalisme. Very clearly. And that is the language of Alf Hegel in the classic sense that Hegel uses. The, um, Hegel and Marx speak exactly of a transcending and doing away with. But transcending in that sense, right? Alf Hegel, dépassement, is not uh, um, kind of just, just forgetting about it. I don't, I don't think we should forget about all of the great things that capitalism has brought. It's not to say we shouldn't do away with capitalism, but transcend. Yeah? And uh, will wealth go away? Let's not be speculative leftists. <laughs> Let's move towards concrete measures of practical equality. Badger's wrong and Badger's right. <laughs> All right, probably one final question, and then uh, let's keep the questions for coffee break so that you can... Uh, yeah, catch Campbell. Yes, please. So I just finished reading some ethnographic work that looked closely at undocumented transient migrant labor across Europe. Okay. And I'm just pursuing this line of thinking around what is possible. So 
you quoted Badiou saying that capitalism always puts bodies where they ought not to be. And I want to restate that saying that capitalism has an unerring genius for gathering up the bodies that it needs mm -hmm. and putting them where they're required to fuel yep. capitalist production. So this, this piece of uh, research that I looked at was looking at the lives of <coughs> uh, illegal, undocumented labor arriving in Britain get, uh, from all across the margins of Europe, whether Albania, Macedonia, uh, Ukraine, uh, showing up early at dawn every morning, waiting to be called for some whatever work that might be available, and then transported to factory farms, or to <coughs> strawberries, yep. working punishing hours, um, always at risk for injury and no one is held accountable. But then, <coughs> that seems to be the reality of growing numbers of people who are fueling production in mm. Europe. H how do you think about what is possible there? Because mm. these yeah. people are, you imagine you're fleeing something even more unendurable mm. to come and endure what they're enduring. So what does it mean to ask what is possible? Mm. Yeah, and, I mean this is not just this is not just Europe. This is the um, <coughs> this is the construction workers who are building Singapore. Yeah. This is the uh, people who are fishing the oceans of this country. I mean this is the reality of. Uh, yeah. And I and just and add to that that, that yeah. in a way you could say this has always been the case. Whether you thought of slaves in ancient times, or slaves and in indentured labourers in colonial times. These are the modern day expendable bodies. Yeah, and this is where I, I think that Beju's <coughs> assertions uh, of practical politics that, um, and it's premised on his motto for it is um, there is only one world. There's only one world. We, we all who live and work and exist in this world, who are in this world, we are and equally have a right to exist. And what capital does is it creates um, separations, barriers, divisions, and um, yeah. I mean, um, You've got hypocritical scoundrels uh, like Mike Moore write books about how global in this country write books about how globalization makes one world, right? It makes yes, it makes one world, but one world in which there are two worlds in it, right? And um, the the interesting thing for me about Badger's work is that he he proposes one world, but it's one world in which which is premised on multiplicity, right? So it's premised on the beginning point of that is multiplicity. Um, Equally, it's what Hegel calls singularity, right? So the fact of many particularities <coughs> existing within it. It's a, it's a universal which includes particularities in it, right? I think that's got to be the starting point. Um, otherwise, we get on the, um, in, in academic terms, we get on this kind of, well, let's look at all particularities because the world's so complex and we must not universalise and so forth, right? Yeah? That was called postmodernism and post-structuralism and social construction and all that, right? We're done with that. That is done. That is not useful. That is a, a project of repeating. The, the dynamics of multiplication that is capital, right? Um, Badger's, Badger's proposal, there is one world, is a way of exactly challenging that, of saying those people who are there who have only a minimal right to exist also exist and deserve equally the right to existence as everyone else. Yeah? And I think there's a practical politics in that that's really important uh, for the left. It's ontological, but it's also quite directly political as well. Or, to put it differently, the ontological, the philosophical, is not separate from the political. Yep. They've returned to each other uh, so that they can inform each other. Right? And then there's no more abstract philosophy done down that end and practical politics done here or on outside. That moving between and across borders is absolutely crucial. And in terms of the argument in terms of intellectual, I've not gone into the whole thing here, um, but I've done this again and again in other places. That movement intellectually between different spaces is absolutely quite crucial, right? Within the, the university is um, is cut up by people who want to not have to listen to other people, right? And that remember, the division of labour in the university is premised on Immanuel Kant's appropriation of Adam Smith's idea of the division of labour. It's very, very clear about it, right? The foundation of the modern German university is premised on the idea of mass production, the division of labour, right? Which is a principle that Kant takes from Adam Smith directly, right? Uh, read the groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, the second preface to the contribution of the critique of, um, uh, to critique of pure reason. He's very clear. Division is a good thing for Kant, right? And Hegel's point is, well, the things that are divided 
are implicated in each other, even when divided. So those people who are doing the fishing are implicated in our dinner tonight. So they should exist, because they do. All right, thank you very much for this lovely intervention.